Welcome to the Mosaic Ventures podcast. I'm Toby, and I am delighted to be here today with Daniel Hegarty, the founder and CEO of Habito. We have a uh, focus, as you all know, on around fintech and have been pursuing a, a, a strategy associated with the unbundling of the banks and the opportunity for startups to attack lots of interesting product categories within banking and Habito is doing just that. So we're very uh, ha happy and fortunate to be joined by Daniel today. And maybe we'll kick off, to Daniel, with just a question of, around the, the mortgage industry overall. You know, why did you pick this industry? Why did you think there was a burning problem to be solved here? You've, you've obviously spent many years in the, uh, the lending space overall and, and um, previously in personal lending and now in mortgages, so why mortgages? Well firstly, thank you for having me, thanks for bringing the roadshow to the, the Habit offices, it's kind of you. Um, so I think there, there were kind of, there's two different angles at which that kind of led us towards mortgage in the end, and the, the first was a personal experience. I was buying my first house, um, it was about two and a half years ago now, and had a fairly, a fairly horrific experience with a, a traditional mortgage broker where my application was, was sent off to the lender and they accidentally had put my, my own name, my wife's name and my wife's name again. So my application was declined on the basis that I was possibly a bigamist or worse, um, which took about 10 days. And 10 days when you're trying to buy your first house and you're in a chain, or the, the seller was in a chain, is, is a long time. Um, they then realising the error, resubmitted the application, um, this time removing me and just but it having my wife and my wife on the application. Um, so another 10 days were passed, and it was just, it was like a pretty, it's sort of, it's sort of funny in retrospect, but at the time it was a pretty terrifying and sort of disempowering um, experience. Um, and as, as, you know, we got there in the end, just about having biked some documents across London, um, but it did, it kind of left me feeling that I just, I couldn't really comprehend how the industry worked and how the brokers interacted with the lenders and the regulator, and I was keen to have a look if there was something to be done. Which I did. Um, so coming from, uh, yeah, I guess a fairly long background in fintech, kind of particularly focused on machine learning and kind of algorithmic approaches to automating financial services transactions, um, I had, I had, a, I took a really long look at the industry, um, and kind of came to the conclusion or the realization that there were there were no pipes, there was no APIs, no web services, no kind of digital interface between the the players at all. Um, and it seemed like there was a, a real opportunity from the consumer perspective to create a kind of simple, fast, transparent interface to the industry where uh, consumers could, you know, very quickly both find and apply for the mortgage they needed. So that's what we did. That seems so obvious and simple, but why hadn't anyone else uh, figured this out? So again, I think there's two reasons. I think one is, and this, this is both good and bad, is people will always buy houses. You know, like, will Brexit affect us? People will always buy houses. Um, and I think it's a large reason why the, the industry has been so stale and lacked innovation for so long. So I think that's, I don't think there'd been like a, a major impetus within the industry or a kind of competitive impetus to improve. But I think, I think secondarily, like as a, as a kind of FinTech founder, mortgages are just tough. Like they're complicated instruments. There's a lot of different stakeholders. There's, they're very, very heavily regulated. And if you were kind of staring out across the vista seven, five, seven years ago, mortgages were not the thing you would choose ordinarily. But I think as, as fintech touches more and more of the kind of the breadth of financial services, um, I think the, the mortgages were, were a kind of natural move forward. But I think we're only really just arriving at the kind of the, the competency and the kind of engineering capability to be able to solve these problems now. Very interesting. So as you thought about what's the right customer experience with Habito and what, what talk, tell us about what you have built and, and where it goes from here. So yeah, so our kind of our first iteration of our, of our product is it's, it's pretty straightforward really. So you, you would come onto the website, you would tell us some, a few basic details about yourself. Um, you would then interact with our digital mortgage advisor, uh, which is a, a AI powered chatbot that will walk you through your life plans over the next few years and kind of come to a determination on what's the right kind of mortgage for you, not the specific one. 
Um, we, will, we then go off in the background and we survey the entire market, you know, over 60 lenders, 10,000 products, and find the, the, kind of the lowest true cost product. They, like after you know, ignoring introductory rates and cashbacks and all the nonsense that goes on in this market, like what is actually going to be the cheapest over the, the period of the loan. Um, we recommend it to you. You have a look at it if you're comfortable with that. Um, you hit go and we'll then on your behalf go off and apply to the lender and manage, manage you all the way through to completion. So what that means is that a process that you know, historically has taken, I mean sometimes weeks and in my case actually <laughs> months, um, can now really be achieved in you know, up to the point of submission in maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big, step, big step forward for the industry and we'd still like it to be faster. So the, you know, the consumer journey that you've, you've chosen simplifies you know, getting a mortgage. Does it solve you know, major pain points for the consumer? Does, 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 do they really care about the simplification? You talk about all these you know, APIs and automation and so forth. As you said, won't they just go through anything to buy a house? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think, I think the broader theme here is that I personally think that consumers are completely disinterested in financial services, fintech or otherwise, shiny websites or otherwise. I think they crave abstraction and they just very, very much want it to be a solved problem for them. So I guess what, you know, there's different ways to approach this and we weren't trying to, I guess we're not trying to give consumers mortgage superpowers. I don't think they want them. I think what they want is somebody to take the problem away, somebody who's, where they can be certain uh, that the product is transparent and comprehensible and clearly, clearly displayed to them, but I don't think they want to be trawling through 10,000 mortgage products. And the, I think the feedback that we've had from our customers makes that very clear, you know, with, our, with some very pleasing trust pilot reviews, you know, which are now you know, up into quite significant volumes. And I think, yeah, I think, I think there, is, there is a misapprehension that everybody, every consumer is as interested in mortgages as I now am. And really the Habito product is not there to try and, you know, suck them into my world of some pretty, pretty dull, dull in a exploration and rather just give them a, a very clean interface and really minimize the amount of time they have to spend in their lives thinking about mortgages. Great. Well, it sounds like you are taking a lot of time out of the process where they don't have to spend hours, I assume, on the phone with a mortgage broker and still faxing paperwork, as I understand it, to, uh, you know, to, to, a, to a mortgage broker and then waiting X number of days to find out from from the bank where their application stands. So, you know, that sounds like a real leap forward. Uh, you know, as you think further forward into the future, you know, you know can, can, can Habito you know, turn the mortgage industry on its head? Well, like I hope so. Actually, uh, it was somebody said to me yesterday that they thought there had been a, a pretty significant kind of uh, industry figure um, so to me, yesterday, thought there'd been more innovation in the mortgage industry in the last 12 months than in the preceding 10 years. Um, and I think, you know, like, and if whatever part we have to play in that, we're very, we're very pleased about. But no, I think, you know, we, we certainly feel like we're just getting started. And I think, so we've, we've taken a, yeah, this fairly long and arduous and, and, and frightening process with the consumer and compacted it and made it clear. But ultimately, we're still somewhat at the mercy of the lenders. So by the time, you know, we submit the application and then we, we chase and monitor and communicate. But... Ultimately, if the lenders have a really slow manual process, then you know, that's hard for us to deal with at the moment. So a lot of our focus is how can we kind of develop deeper, deeper relationships with the lenders. We spend a lot of time talking to them about this. Um, so we can take out you know, duplication of having to submit documents twice or, uh, or potentially even three times. Um, how can we get to uh, you know, real-time decisioning on these products rather than you know, we'll get back to you in a week once we've looked at your bank statements. And um, those, I think, you know, these these are these things are not far away. Like they, I think we'll be you know talking more about them this year. Um, and and I think that generally the, the feeling I get from the industry is not um, it's not a question of if it's just it's when and how we're going to come to kind of a common understanding of how to achieve these goals. And as you as you think about you know, the consumer, does it, does it matter where they get their mortgage from? Does it matter who the lender is? Does it matter you know, when they when they look at this? confusing array of products who they ultimately get their mortgage from? Well, I mean, that depends who you ask. I think if you ask a, a mortgage lender, they would tell you it very much does matter. I mean, I should be careful what I say, but I think, broadly speaking, mortgages are commodities for, for consumers. They are, they're really only differenti differentiated by whether, you know, eligibility, like can I get the mortgage and price, how much is it going to cost me? So there are, listen, there are gotchas around, you know, like standard variable rates in the future and market, market movements where 
you know, there are products you would, you would want to avoid and we, we advise on that basis. Um, but in general, no. Like it's, you know, it's, they're transactional products. You're only likely to ever speak to your mortgage lender again if you want to move your payment date or remortgage. So, no. Interesting. And when you think about it, where the UK mortgage market is and you, you know, you're a student of lots of other markets, how would you compare it with where things are today, even in the US or in the Netherlands or other countries? So there's, there's some, it's not a very homogenous kind of global market. Like as you move from country to country, it looks very different. I think the one thing that I, I absolutely love about the US market is they have a federally standardized mortgage application form. One form to rule them all, which um, such a such a simple thing that would have probably saved us a thousand man hours of engineering time. So um, I think a little bit more standardization in the UK market would, would be no bad thing. Um, the US is only, so the UK is just under 80% broker inter- intermediated. So this kind of notion of you trotting down to the bank to go and see your bank manager for a mortgage is definitely a thing of the past. I think that's a great thing for consumers in terms of price competition and, and products availability. Um, the US is only 14%. So you're looking at a market that still effectively deals with its local banks, um, you know, on this kind of state by state basis. So, I think in terms of uh, the, it's 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 like it's an interesting thing, you know. They're so much more advanced in some ways in terms of the actual application process and the speed of completion, um, but in terms of the kind of the, the range of products, they're much much more limited. There's only effectively three product types in the, in the UK, uh, sorry, in the US, maybe 500 here. So there are the big differences there. I think the, the Netherlands is a particularly interesting mortgage market. They have kind of moved away from the traditional kind of lender balance sheet funded model and are now, I think at last count, are around 25% of their mortgages are funded either by pension funds or insurance companies. To my mind, that's, that's quite a, a natural progression, particularly given the kind of time horizons that you know, pension funds are looking to realize profit on. So, you know, it, so for example, in, in the US, quite standard to get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. In the UK, very non-standard to get anything beyond five years. Um, and again, in, in, in the Netherlands, you're seeing yeah, a, a pretty material number of 30-year products coming to market, which, you know, to my mind, is, is very attractive, particularly in a kind of the low interest rate environment we're in now. Um, so no, I think, I think that's encouraging. It's great to see innovation, not just on the consumer side, but also on the funding side. And I think anything that we could do that allows kind of new, novel, differentiated products to come to market, we would we'd be very keen to engage in. That's fascinating what's happened in, in, in the Netherlands and in, in not a, a long period of time, how some of these non-traditional lenders have uh, come into the market. And as you said, there's a, a match in terms of liabilities and assets for them with their sort of very long-term horizon. So it definitely feels like one to watch. You know, as you think about you know, what Habito can build, you, given that you're having real-time conversations with a consumer about you know, a mortgage product. Does that change you know, the breadth of offers that you can provide? Does it change the type of products that you can offer? I mean, you, you'll, you're not limited to, obviously to the shelf space that you know, a retail bank necessarily has or, or you know, the features of a, of a, a standard mortgage. You know, does, does it allow you to offer much more personalized or customized products? Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely it does. And I think there's a number of reasons. I think, you know, we, the mortgage brokerage is a, is a commission-led business. Um, and I think, therefore, you know, there's a, a kind of a, some moral hazard in wanting to just push this, you know, put, sell the same product that you're familiar with frequently, which is probably to some degree why we see such a preponderance of two-year fixed rate mortgages. I think the market's about 83% two-year fixed rate mortgages. Um, but also in just trying to minimize the amount of time spent on each consumer. Um, so given that you know, not you know, we we have in-house mortgage experts who are talking to customers all the time, but given that we're taking some of the kind of the, the kind of dumb heavy lifting out of the process, um, yeah, I think we we certainly have more time to explore more of the detail of a customer's financial life, and also just to have I guess the kind of is that going to be a, okay? So we've just got a lorry coming past. Um, I think it might be a cement mixer, in fact. <laughs> so it could be there for a while. Uh, it's, been, it's been coming past each day. Um, yeah, given, given that it's a large part of the, advice, uh, the advisory process for the Habitat is automated, um, there's certainly the possibility for exploring like, more complex cases and more interesting products as they come to market, which perhaps in the a more traditional mortgage broking environment, you would need to spend many hours training your workforce to understand. Um, yeah. You know, as uh, 
yeah, an, an entrepreneur in the real estate and fintech spaces, you know, you must come across a lot of very interesting startups. I'd love to hear, you know, what, what you're seeing out there, what, what you're impressed by. Yeah, so we, look, we do interact with a lot of startups in the space, and we're seeing or a range of things, you know, I guess all the way down the stack from, you know, at the very top, the kind of online estate agents. Um, I mean, one company we spent a bit of time with is Nested, mm -hmm. familiar with those guys, yeah. who, um, you know, are offering effectively a, a kind of 90-day guarantee on the sale of your house, not dissimilar to the open door product that's launched in the US. And I think, I find it, look, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex product and I, I wouldn't presume to comment on it, on it, you know, its feasibility, but I think what is, what is clear is that uncertainty is really paramount in the house purchasing process and anything that can be done to alleviate that I think is, is super interesting and has a place in the kind of the consumer the consumer market. So that's exciting. And actually and around that we're also seeing you know some real developments in the kind of automated valuation space. There's a few different startups that we've taken a look at who are, you know, the, the kind of the traditional methods of kind of algorithmically valuing houses are really pretty pretty simplistic at best. And um, I think big strides are being made there already. What else is interesting? I mean, then again, again on the kind of the lending side, you know, th these companies have been around a little bit longer, but there's certainly some some interesting kind of you know fractional investment products like Property Partner, um, and on the bridging side, the Lend Invest guys. All like, I think, you know, to, to me they're more they're less consumer products, they're more sophisticated investor products. But I think I guess the common the common theme here is this kind of carving out these small niches of of demand and, and providing a bit clearer and more speedy access to, to the market. But I think the, the really transformative kind of step is yet to come. And I think that, you know, the reality is we lack any kind of common transactional spine, if you like, for, for real estate transactions, mortgage transactions and so on. And I think and it would take a very brave business to think that it was going to, you know, take on the regulator, create new laws and become the kind of the common standard for the you know, the blockchain for property ownership or whatever else. But um, until, until there is, you know, meaningful transition in the kind of legal requirements around property titles, surveying, searches, you know, lo local authority searches, you know, we are, we're going to remain some distance from same-day property transactions, which, I mean, just seem like a very natural, natural place for us to get to. But it's, I think it's quite hard to find a, a business that's going to have a natural incentive to go and build that and take on that risk. And it sounds like you're right in the thick of things. Maybe just stepping back, you've been operating in fintech businesses for, for some years, you know, and when you set out to build Habito, you know, a, few, a few years ago, you, you, you thought a lot about the team that you were going to build, and you know, it looks like you've assembled a, a terrific group of, of people here. I mean, how, how hard is it to build a, a startup like this, get the t type of talent you need in London, and you know, do you have any advice for any sort of first-time entrepreneurs who would be thinking about um, doing their own startup? That's a, that's a good question. Um, it's really, I mean, it's really challenging. I think you know, first and foremost, finding great engineering talent is it's very, very challenging at this point in this market. And I think there's a, and I, I hold quite strong views on this. And I think there's a, a lot of companies very successfully, you know, building products with outsourced teams. That it just isn't. It's just not how I, I think about building a business. I think, you know, to me, the, the only two things that really matter in a startup are clarity of purpose and speed of execution. And I think they're both irreparably harmed by having your engineering sit outside of your, your building, if you like. So, no, I think, I think that's a real challenge, and it's, and it's an expensive way to, to do it, <laughs> as you know. So, yeah, no, my, my advice would be, like, find one great engineer and, like, you know, not someone who's just read a few blog, blog posts about Scala or whatever else, like someone who's got proven... You know, proven track record of building great consumer products, um, and trust trust that he can inspire other people to join. Um, but that, for me, you know, the, the bar is just so high in consumer tech now. Like, you can't have clunky products, you can't have poor user experience, and expect consumers to be excited about it. Um, so yeah, job one, great engineers every time. Very interesting. Maybe uh, I'd love to hear your views on you know London as a as a fintech. Hub, you know, how, how did you feel like it's living up to the hype? Or do you feel like there are some fantastic entrepreneurs and businesses that are have been built here, or do you feel a lot of that is still to come? I think I think it's in a kind of adolescent stage. You know, I guess I've, I've been involved in fintech in London since two thousand and seven, um, and at that time, like it felt very much like we were perhaps the only people engaged in it. 
Um, you know, we, and I guess Zopra were around at that point, and but it was still you know, years before you know a funding circle or a transfer wise had even been founded. So it was, yeah, I mean, compared to ten years ago, it's a vastly different place. But having said that, you know, still most of the most of the great businesses, you know, are not are not through to exit. And we're starting to see the kind of recycling of capital from some of those founders into companies like us, which is great. And I think more important than the capital is the, the experience and the operational knowledge. Um, no, look, I don't, I don't think London's there yet. I think it's still got a huge amount to prove, but in terms of initial conditions, I can't think of you know, a much better situation, barring Brexit, <laughs> which is a, perhaps a different conversation. Well, I think Brexit is happening whether we like it or not. Yeah. So I think we're, all, we're all going to have to live with it. Indeed. Well, look, Daniel, thank you very much for uh, being our guest on the Mosaic podcast. And good luck uh, with spending all that money that you just uh, collected. <laughs> That's the message you want from your investors. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. It's been, it's been a pleasure.